In Matthew chapter 11, at the very end of it, if you look at this last verse, he says, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke was used to put on the shoulder of the ox as it worked. There are yokes for people also. A milkmaid would often use a long pole, a stick on her shoulders to hold two jugs of milk. They called that a yoke also. It's used for work, for carrying a load, for holding a burden. And Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I want you to understand, by having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're actually letting go of your own burdens. And when you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation is easy. That's what it says. My yoke is easy. And I want to talk tonight about easy believism. Amen. Easy believism. That's a phrase that Presbyterians like to throw out there. Well, you don't think you have to do good works to keep your salvation? What is it? Easy believism. And they'll use phrases to insult the gospel of Christ. They'll call it greasy grace or easy believe it. They have all these words they use to really discount what Jesus did for us. When our parents gave us birthday presents or Christmas presents, they were free. Right. It wasn't based on our merit or our good works. Salvation is a free gift from God. It's not how great we are or will be. It's not how much we promise to do or what we promise we'll stop doing. There's a movement today called the free grace movement. Free grace. Now, free grace, I don't have a problem with that term. Uh, the movement, it seems to be this eclectic group of Christians that are coming out of these apostate denominations. And they're coming to the realization that they've been under the burden of a works-based salvation, a lordship salvation, reformed theology, Calvinism, Catholicism, Presbyterianism, whatever it is, it's works. They're trusting in their works for salvation. They were raised that way. They come to the realization, wait a minute, the church I was raised in is wrong. They're teaching me something. They realize that salvation has always been by faith without any works of the law. And so there's this movement today, and it's gotten this label, free grace. It's not specifically something we would put on the sign on the road for our church, but yet there's, I have no opposition to that phrase by any means. The word grace itself means free. It means gift. So, you know, it's like the grace gift, the gift gift, the free gift. Well, those are all, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. So uh, the free grace movement, as it were, I don't really have a problem with it necessarily, although there are some problems within it. There are people that say they're free grace, but then they're advocating for people to do unrighteous things. So I want to talk about that for a second because I, I find it amazing that our young men and old men went out soul winning today and run into this contradiction of somebody. And didn't they have a problem with once saved, always saved? Wasn't that ultimately their problem, that they have a problem that you say, I can be saved by what Jesus did, and I don't have to do anything to be saved, and I don't have to do anything to keep my salvation, and they had a serious problem with that, to the point of contention and argument. The world loves a work salvation because they feel they're doing something. They can pat themselves on the back. I'm not as bad as I used to be. I'm not as bad as that guy. You know, you should have seen me 20 years ago. I've really earned salvation. So the title of my sermon tonight will be the, the Free Grace Fallacy. A fallacy is a misunderstanding or a disbelief, a false accusation. There are a lot of people that falsely accuse those in a free grace or easy believers in camp of teaching things that they simply don't teach. And I just want to show you what the Bible teaches. Um, one of their quotes, you can, that here's what they say. That, um, I think this was um, uh, Got Answers or one of those liberal Protestant, not, not Christian, Protestant websites. And here's what they say about free grace. They say that, that they accuse them. They say, you can have assurance of salvation if you trusted Christ for one second, sometime during your life. There is no need for perseverance, no outward signs of regeneration, and no need to repent of your sins. So that's them unloading the truck saying, here's everything wrong with them. 
And if you notice those last three things they said are, they don't do the works, they're not doing the works, they're not doing the works. Well, we should do good works to glorify our Father in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. But that's not how I get to heaven. That's not how I was adopted into the family, John 1, 12. To them gave me power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm adopted into the family. God is now my Father. He tells us in Galatians chapter 3, we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. I'm a child by faith. Now I'm in the family forever. That's His promise. The history of the free grace movement, it's interesting, it actually came out of fundamental Baptist churches, and they were teaching salvation by faith alone, without any works. This was not a Protestant church, this was not a Reformed Baptist church, this was not a Catholic Calvinist church, this was independent, fundamental, King James only, Baptist church, where this movement sort of sprung out of it in this new group of people, and a lot of it's really like online. These people online that like, I've discovered the truth. I was reading the Bible and I saw this video and now I figured it out. I don't have to work my way to heaven. Praise the Lord. I'm a free gracer. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's just a biblical Christianity. And the thing about a biblical Christian is this is the source of all doctrine. Isn't, isn't this the head of the church truly? If I get up here and I say something against this or the Lord Jesus Christ, you better run me out of here. I'm serious. You better, anybody that would do that, you run them out. That's your job. I mean, that is the Baptist tradition that we would say it's the Word of God. It's not some Protestant confession. It's not some Presbyterian confession. It's not a revo Reformed London Baptist confession, which is a big statement of a bunch of stuff that some of it kind of sounds okay, but other things, the more you dig in, you understand where they're coming from. It's, it's dead wrong. It's a different gospel. We are, we are not the uh, traditional Christians, the Orthodox Christians. No, no, independent fundamental Baptists have always been separate from Protestantism. We are not mainstream. We've always had to fight against those that preach Reformed theology and works salvation. There have always been a remnant of those that believe in salvation by faith alone, plus nothing, minus nothing. This is important. Don't minus the blood, John MacArthur. Right? Don't add works, John Piper. I could go through a list of names. I'm going to try to keep that out there. Uh, I want to focus in here. And I just want to tell you, this is the authority. Anytime you run into somebody that says you have to do the works to be saved, this is not their authority. Their church organization is their authority. Their confessional statement is their authority. Not this. And it's interesting because in the free grace movement you have a lot of uh, Christians living in a broken ways. Uh, I'll speak from a personal experience with some people that I had met back in the day. They were potheads. And I tell you, every pothead loves the free grace gospel because you don't have to, it's not necessary to change your life to go to heaven. And I got to tell you, potheads, listen, Jesus loves potheads. He died for them too. All right? Now, should they continue in their sin? Well, we're going to deal with that. We're going to show you what the Bible says. If they don't stop their sin, can they still go to heaven? I want to show you what the Bible says. I've got four questions I'm going to ask tonight. How is it that we're saved without the law? What is the purpose of the law? Can you lose your salvation? And what about ex-Christians? What about ex-Christians? Well, I used to be a Christian, but... So I want to deal with those four topics. If you would, please go to Romans chapter 4. Go to Romans chapter 4. First question, how is it, how are we saved without the law? As you're going to Romans 4, allow me to read Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So I'm not saved by works. It's by His mercy. He was merciful to me. And that's exactly what Ephesians 2 says. It's not by works. He says, ye are saved through faith. Ephesians 2.8 says, saved through faith, not of works. Galatians 2, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ 
that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Those are two great verses, three now I've given you, that say you're not saved by works, you're not saved by works, you don't have to keep it by works. Now you're in Romans 4. Let's take a look at this. Look at verse number 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Glory in this regard means to brag. If I were going to heaven because I'm a good person, I could brag to you, but I can't brag to God because he knows better than that, and I don't deserve heaven. None of us deserve heaven. It's a free gift. Verse 3, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So by trusting in his heart, he was counted as a perfect man by his faith in Jesus. If you will, go to the next chapter. Go to chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Look at verse number 1. Therefore being justified by faith, well there it is again, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know, there it is again, really strong. You don't get grace except by faith. This is super important because there's different movements out there that are in different camps. The phrase, Lordship Salvation, would teach that you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life or you're not really saved. And what they mean by that is you have to obey every commandment. If you don't obey every commandment, then you're not really saved. That's what Lordship Salvation teaches. Well, if He's your Savior, then you're going to make Him the Lord. And if you didn't make Him the Lord and obey everything, then you're not really saved. And what they're doing is they're putting the burden of salvation on your weak flesh. And now you have to trust in yourself, and you can't trust your flesh. I can't earn salvation. Lordship Salvation says... Grace only comes by your, by your earned merit, by keeping the law, by obeying every commandment. We'll look at verse number 8, Romans 5, verse number 8. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Those words are so beautiful. While we were yet sinners. If we were honest with ourselves, and I said, who's a sinner in here? Brother Jake was the first one to put his hand up. I'm going to pick on him. <laughs> we would all put our hands up. And I said, of course I'm a sinner. Of course I fall short. Of course I don't always obey everything God says. Thank God we're, what we, what we see? Saved by His mercy. Titus chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 2. Saved by faith. We have access to this grace. We get the gift by trusting in what He did. I don't trust a prayer I've said. I don't trust a sin I've turned from. I don't trust my church attendance. I don't trust my giving. I trust in Jesus. He did it all. Look at verse 15 in this same chapter, verse 15. Romans 5, 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. So the offense is over here. You've offended God. Well, over here is the gift. And you know what? That free gift is greater. He says, for if through the offense of one, many be dead, talking about when Adam sinned and sin entered the world and death by sin, he says, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. How do you get grace? By gift. How do you get it? By faith. It was free. Free grace is a true and accurate statement. It really is. There, I mean, anything other than free grace is an oxymoron. You don't have an earned gift. You have an earned reward. Those of you men that work a job... Friday rolls around, the boss says, well, I'm going to be good to you this week. I'm going to go ahead and pay you for the hours you work. This is my gift to you. 
You say, no, sure, buddy, you owe it to me because I put in the work. That's my wages. You better give it to me or I'm calling the labor board, right? Wages are earned. Rewards are earned. Gifts are free, totally free. It has to be no strings attached or it's not even a gift. Grace must be free or it is no more grace is what the Bible says. If you would go to the next chapter, chapter 6. Again, Ephesians 2, he says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Remember those words. Let it resonate. Saved through faith. You're not saved because of Calvinism, which says the Holy Spirit comes into you before you hear the Gospel. And you're born again before you hear the Gospel. And you're regenerated before you hear the Gospel. And the Holy Spirit forces you to become a better person. And when somebody brings the Gospel to you, you have an aha moment. And it's like, the, the Lord just flipped the switch and turned the, the light on and now I'm a child of God. I know it for sure because I will endure all the way to the end perfectly preserved and blameless. I will become sinless in my life. That's the gospel of Calvinism, which is no gospel. They literally teach that there are people that have zero chance of going to heaven because Jesus did not die for them. But those that are special... There's nothing they could do to go to hell. God picked them. They couldn't even believe. They literally teach that faith is a work. They see, of course faith is a work, and we're not saved by works, so God forces it upon us. And He moves into your heart and regenerates you first. Then when you have faith, that's a work of the Holy Spirit. Talk about confusing. And here's the problem. You will never find Calvinism or Reformed theology in the Bible. I mean, unless you're reading a Geneva Bible and it has John Calvin's notes in the sideline. You will never find it in the Bible without going to some institute or re reading some book by some Presbyterian or some Catholic. You cannot f find this theology anywhere in this book. It doesn't exist. It's man-made, 100%. Not by works, lest any man should boast. And you know what they do? The Calvinist says, well, faith is a work. And you know what they do? They boast that they're special. They're one of God's elect. And you're not. You're a reprobate. What an evil heart. What is the purpose of the law? So, point one. Are we saved by the law? No. Prove we're not saved by the law. Well, I just gave you a good list of verses. So then what is the purpose of God giving us His law? Romans chapter 6, look at verse number 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So let me pick on my pothead buddy. Hey bro, it's alright. I'm free in Christ. Well that's true my friend. You can smoke weed until your eyes go crossed and you're still going to heaven because Jesus loved you. But here's the problem. He might take you home early because of a sin unto death. You might die of lung cancer early. Or you might lose your sobriety and get on the road and run into a tree, or God forbid, run into somebody else and kill innocent blood because you're drunken uh, from the weed. Because you're, you're stupor from being high. So can you do that and still go to heaven? Well, of course. Salvation is not dependent upon whether you're sober when you die. Salvation is not dependent upon your opinion of politics. Salvation is not dependent upon your opinion of creation theology. I know some Christians that have some really bad theology about creation. They don't believe the simple account of Genesis. They've tried to reconcile with evolution. And it's like they've mixed a little evolution with a little bit of their creation. And they have their own little new thing. And it's like, that's foolishness. But they say they're saved by faith alone, and I'm not going to take that from them, because God won't either. Can you have bad doctrine and still go to heaven? Amen. Can you have sin in your life and still go to heaven? Well, I think actually everybody that dies and goes to heaven still has sin in their life. Are you telling me you can have smelly feet and bad breath and still go, well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, we're just flesh, right? 
So then what is the purpose of the law? He says, shall we continue in sin? God forbid. Here's the law. It's going to enter in and say, by the way, now that you belong unto your Father in heaven, now that you've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, He wants you to follow in His footsteps and become a disciple and begin to separate yourself from the world and start to look a little different than everybody else. Mind you, not all disciples are saved. And not all people that live a clean life are saved either. If you don't believe me, just run into some Mormons. Verse 2, God forbid. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, how do you reconcile this statement? Who in here would say, I have no more temptation? It doesn't exist. I'm never tempted to sin. Not one person raised their hand. Why? Well, because you're still in the flesh. When he says you're dead to sin, he's talking about your spiritual status with the Lord. You are redeemed. You are purchased. You are righteous in your soul because of the blood of Jesus Christ, but there's still a problem in your flesh, and that's a battle you have to fight every single day. It's the classical old man, new man. I'm a new man because the Holy Spirit's in me and He's moved me in a new direction. And that old man is tugging me back where I came from because the flesh sure does like what it likes and i got to fight that every single day. So the law is here to show me how to fight that battle so the Holy Spirit in me can say, God forbid. So when temptation raises in your flesh, you just say, stop it, stop it, God forbid. I don't want to do that. How shall I continue in sin? No, God forbid. I'm going to go that way. Look what he says. Know ye not, verse 3, that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death. There's that spiritual picture of baptism. Once you're saved, you're immersed in the body of Christ. That was the spiritual baptism. We're going to have a baptism that is a picture. They go under the water like they're dead, and they come out of the water like the resurrection, picturing what Christ did. Look at verse 4. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, so that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, look at this, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now that you're saved, you should walk in newness of life. The free grace fallacy is this. Well, they teach once saved, always saved. They just say, go and sin all you want. Well, that's not what Jesus said. To the person that got saved and healed, He said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, go and sin no more, or you're going to lose your salvation. Right. Now that you're saved, go and sin no more. Well, I stumbled and I fell and I sinned again. And the Lord says, I've forgiven it. Now get back up and go again. The free grace fallacy is they teach, they say, that because we believe in salvation without any works, that we are opposed to the law. Uh, antinomianism, I believe, is the term they use. Anti-law. Let me tell you something. Biblical Christianity is not anti-law, nor is it anarchist. I believe in authority, and I believe in the law. I know I'm not saved by it. There is the law of faith. We have the law of liberty. God gives us the law of love. He gives us all these beautiful pictures so that we can comprehend Him. And the truth of the matter is we're saved through faith. Why? So the Holy Spirit can move in. Why? So now I can become dead to that old man and actually keep the law and please my Father. Once you're saved, should you keep the law? Amen. You should do the best you can to keep every godly law. If it's not a godly law, I wouldn't recommend you keep it. Just like the Hebrew midwives. Kill the babies? I think I'll risk my life and disobey Pharaoh. Right? Romans 13, when they become evil, when the government becomes evil, we disobey the government and we obey the Most High. The Most High, God Himself. Look at verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness with His death, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Ah, now the Lord Jesus Christ died and He came back. He came back in the resurrection. He says, you're going to be resurrected one day. And when you're resurrected, we're going to be rewarded for the work that we do here. So why does God give us the law? So that we know what we have to do to earn a reward. 
Those of you that work a job, your boss probably has certain things he wants you to do and certain things he does not want you to do. Fair enough? Uh, Brother Larry, are you allowed to pay, play Tetris while you're driving? Can you take your truck home? Uh, no, I do not. Okay. Uh, Brother Chad, do you have to answer the phone when the boss calls? If I'm not driving. If you're not driving. Good answer. Whoa, talk about fighting the law with the law. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Uh, brother, brother, um, I'll pick on, on Brother um, um, Doug in the back. When you're at the firing range and you're teaching somebody how to shoot a gun, and you're trying to tell them what not to do, do you just fire a couple live rounds and say, don't do this? Or would you be breaking the law of the house that you're in? Yeah, they would probably drag you out, wouldn't they? Okay, all right. So what is the law for? So that we can please our master. What is the law for? Well, we're going to be resurrected one day. We're going to be rewarded for what we do. We might as well do the best we can right now. What is the law for? So we don't destroy ourselves. We have a law at our house. The dogs and the chickens are not allowed in the road. The dog broke the law today. And a neighbor dragged the dog back into the fence and came in here into the church building and told me, your dog broke the law. I said, oh, no, I'm sorry. Then she said, wow, I haven't been in here in many years. I said, well, come on back. We're singing next Sunday. <laughs> if your children play in the road, now think about it. Think about it. If your children play in the road, they're breaking your law, right, Dad, right, Mom? Are they still your children? No. Of course. Now, they get ran over, you have to bury a child, that's going to be a horrible thing. And you're going to say, why did you break the law? It destroyed you. And sometimes the Father looks at us while we're given to our lust and our sin and our covetousness and our greed and our lies and our pride. And he says, why are you still breaking my law? I told you what to do. I've given you the Holy Spirit. You know the Word of God. You're not ignorant of it. Don't live like a hippie. Be a Christian. That you should walk in newness of life. Now you can appreciate the law for the value that it has. We know that we're not saved by the law, but you know what? It might just save your life. What is the purpose of the law? If you will, look at verse number 6. Romans 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. The law helps us see what the sin is, so we can see it as exceedingly sinful, and know what repulses the Lord, and what He hates in our life, and we can begin to look more like His children. Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. You can become dead to the old man, and free to live a good, holy Christian life, and no unsaved person can do that. No person that's keeping the law for righteousness is free to do that. They don't have that freedom. Look at verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Who's driving you? The Bible uses the phrase reins. Reins are what you would use on your horse. That's how you drive it. The, the Adam Fannin version, I think it calls it a steering wheel. <laughs> the steering wheel of your heart. So there's a steering wheel in your heart. What's driving you? Well, here he says, don't let sin reign in your body. He says, it'll destroy you. Verse 23, look at the end of this chapter. For the wages of sin is death. This is what happens when you, when you disobey the law, you may destroy your life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Calvinist does not believe that. The Presbyterian does not believe that. The Nazarene does not believe that. The Arminianism doesn't believe that. They believe they can lose their salvation. They have to be good to keep it. I mean, right on down the line. I could ask and everybody could give me a nut. The Mormon doesn't believe that. They don't believe the gift of God is eternal life. They believe the gift of God is something that He will take back, that it's temporary life. They believe the gift of God is obtained by keeping the law. And if you don't keep the law, you don't get the gift. That's not what the Bible says. Go to the next chapter. Chapter 7, verse 1. The law is here to help us. The law 
is for our sinful flesh to show us our need of the Savior. Look at Romans 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Oh, wait a minute. Do you know what that just said? Your body is under God's law. Whether you're saved or not, your body is under that law. If you drink poison, it will kill you. When your body dies, you are completely free of God's law. You don't have to worry about the law anymore. So get this. The old man, your body, the flesh, is always under the law. The new man, the spirit, is sealed by the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus Christ. It, you cannot obtain that gift by keeping the law. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he live. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. He uses the illustration of marriage, and it's no wonder that uh, Babylon, a system of whoredoms, it uses these words adultery, that we commit spiritual adultery when we choose to sin against God. And here he says, listen, you're under the law as long as you're alive, and as soon as you die, you're with Christ, absent from the body, present with the Lord, and these earthly laws have no law over you. They have no bearing. It's not your authority. You should keep the law. It will keep your life alive, but that's not how we get saved. Salvation has always been by faith. It's God's gift. It's through His mercy. Our body is under the law. Our body will not be saved from the law of death your body will probably die unless you're here when the Lord returns. So we should keep our body under the law. And we should obey and to please God and be rewarded. Our spirit is sealed unto the day of redemption. And that didn't happen by keeping the law. Go to John chapter 6. So here's my next question. Can you lose salvation? So first it was, how are we saved without the law? Then it, what is the purpose of the law? Finally, can you lose your salvation? And I think all of y'all know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> the only way you could lose your salvation is if you earned it yourself. Which since you can't earn salvation, neither can you lose it. You're going to John 6. Let me read Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Once you're saved, he will never leave you. He will not forsake you. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. He's talking about being born again in the Spirit. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. How do we overcome this world and get out of here? The only exit is faith in Christ. 1 John 5, 5, For who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? That's it. That's the key. So, of course, you can't lose it. Revelation 3, 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Isn't it beautiful that salvation is forever? So, here's the plan. You get saved by free grace, by easy believism. Then... You should become a disciple. And as a disciple, the first step is, well, I'm going to get baptized to show that I was spiritually dead and I'm alive forever. Nor now I should walk in newness of life. That's discipleship. And I should learn every word of God and apply it to my life. And then once you start down that path of discipleship, you know what the next step typically is? Sanctification of the flesh. Some people don't understand sanctification. Once you believe on Christ, your soul is sanctified, your spirit is sanctified. However, your body takes a lot of work to set it apart and make it holy. You can't tell me your flesh becomes sanctified, otherwise your tattoos would go away, and your desire, your lust for chocolate would just disappear, and you no longer need coffee, and you know, it looks like you do push-ups, like a perfect body, just like that. Sinless perfection is a lie. No one becomes perfect. Christ was the only one that was perfect, and He died for our sins. 
Salvation, discipleship, then sanctification. Here in John chapter 6, look at verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. There's no way he's going to kick you out of the family for being a bad child, but he might just bring you home early if you commit a sin unto death as a child of God. Now look at verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. That means you have it right now. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Look at verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. What a beautiful verse. How awesome is it that God is giving you this promise, just trust in me. And you're not just trusting in what was done, you're trusting in what I will do. You're trusting and understanding that I've got you. It's all covered. What a beautiful promise. Salvation is not by saying a prayer or bowing down at an altar or checking a box or telling people you're Christian. Salvation is a matter of the heart. And when you trust in Jesus... Your name's written in the book of life. It'll never be blotted out. He'll never let you be plucked out of his hand. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Can you lose your salvation? Of course not. Go to the next chapter, chapter 11. Those that are opposed to free grace or easy believism, every one of them believes you can lose your salvation if you don't endure to the end, if you don't do the good works. They make their salvation dependent upon their performance. John chapter 11, look at verse 25. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? What a great question. If you believe in me, you'll never die. You're spiritually eternal. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. So again, how is it we're saved without the law? Well, it's all by faith in Jesus. So what is the purpose of the law? So that we might live for Jesus. Can you lose your salvation? Not unless Jesus is a liar, and that would be blasphemy to call him a liar. Yeah. Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Thank God he's not a liar. He's made a promise. He'll keep you secure Finally, I want to answer this last question. What about ex-Christians? What about ex-Christians? Anytime I think about this, there's many people from my past that come to mind. One in very particular, we were at a political rally, a political forum. And this was many years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And um, I love our freedom that we have in our country, and I think it's worth fighting for, and I think we ought to wake people up to what the truth is. I really do. And this guy, he and I saw eye to eye on certain things, more libertarian leaning, which just means less government interference, more personal responsibility. And we started agreeing on a couple things, and then I, I quoted a verse or talked about being a Christian. He says, oh, yeah, you know, I used to be a Christian. And I said, I'm, no, man, I'm beyond that. And I said, you, no, no, there is no such thing as a previous Christian. Because once you're saved, you're always saved. And that got him even more mad. Now, we're in a political forum where there's speakers up on the stage and they're doing our thing and we're at the back and we, we were talking in agreement, and now all of a sudden there's a little bit of contention. No, 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 I don't believe in that. There's no, there's no one saved, always saved. And he says, I've read the Bible 50 times. And I said, then quote me one verse. And I truly expected him to just give me John 3.16, and I'd say, well, okay, now that you've quoted that, let me preach the gospel from it and show it's for He couldn't even quote that. Look, I'm mad at him. I'm like, you're going to tell me you were a Christian, but you don't believe Jesus is God. You don't believe salvation is by Jesus Christ. You're going to tell me you've read the Bible 50 times, you can't quote one verse. You're a fake. You never were a Christian. That's right. What will God say? I never knew you. Never. So what about these ex-Christians? Because there's a few of them out there. I've even seen them while I left the Baptist church and became a Catholic. 
It's like, you're not a Christian. You never were a Christian. Matthew 13, this is the parable. The ground, the soil is the hearts of men. The Bible is the seed, the Word of God. We plant those seeds in men's hearts. Let's just read the interpretation of it. Verse number 18. Matthew 13, verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. The first illustration. Somebody, you come to their house. Do you believe in Jesus? You're 100% sure you're going to heaven. Can I share a verse with you? By the way, you know the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it goes, bink, it bounces off their head. They say, I don't understand that. And the devil comes by like a crow and he plucks it up and he leaves. And in five minutes later, they're like, what was that? Something from the Bible, I don't know. I didn't understand it. I've already forgotten it. This is, of the four people we're going to look at, this is the only one that didn't get saved. Why? He did not understand the gospel. So he couldn't receive it. Then he gives us three other people that understand the gospel and receive it, but they all are at different points in their life. Verse 20. But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Uh, uh, soil that has a lot of rocks in it, the roots can't go down very deep. So you're a very shallow Christian and you don't really... You're not very intimate with the Word of God. It's not deep in your heart. And when somebody comes along and they say something and you're opposed to it or you don't have an answer and you get offended, what, you don't believe in evolution? What, are you stupid? Are you one of those Bible thumpers? And they're offended because they're being persecuted and they just kind of, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. And they, some may even deny the Lord or deny Christianity or deny the Bible or deny scientific understanding. But the Bible couldn't be any more clear. They received the seed they became a plant. It's in their heart. Now, this is not a permanent state. There are Christians that go through points like this that because they're ashamed of their response at a moment like this in their life, they end up getting stronger. And they say, man, I've got to put a root down. The illustration he, he's giving us here, there are Christians that will say one thing and then later they're offend, offended or embarrassed and they're like, I don't know. But clearly they're saved. No root. Verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. You know what that is? That's the Christian that they're so focused on getting stuff to take stuff with them. I want, I, if I can just get rich and I'm looking at pictures of big houses I'll never live in, I'm looking at that Lamborghini and I'm hanging around people that want to be rich and I'm playing my video game and talking about money. And they're never in the Word of God, and it's almost like you're choking out what little bit of Word is in their heart. Still saved, but always a babe in Christ. Yeah. Finally, look at verse 23. But he that received seed into the good ground, aha, now that's y'all. I believe you have a good heart. You're the good ground. You're receiving that seed, and you want to grow some fruit for God. He that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the Word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. If you go out preaching the gospel every week, you can get a hundred people saved in a year. Thirty people saved in a year. I've done it more than one year in my life. To get a hundred people, you've got to go out probably two days out of the week. Knock the door, preach the gospel, go for an hour or two, run into people, and you can bring forth a hundredfold fruit in one year. That's entirely possible. Now that glorifies God. I don't say it to glorify me. I say it to try to encourage you that it's doable. You can get 100 people saved next year. You can do it. Well, that's the kind of Christian I want to be. The first person is the one that says, I used to be a Christian. Oh, yeah, I heard the Bible one time. Oh, I grew up in church. I'm not a Christian anymore. They never understood it, and they never received it. 
They never really put the seed in their heart. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. We know what the gospel is. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, where you're going right now, it is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is not adding any works to it. It is not trusting in who you are or who you will be. The gospel is Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. We see that in verse 3 and 4. It calls it the gospel in verse number 1. Look at verse number 2. Look at verse number 2. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You know there are some people that have believed in vain. Years ago I saw this billboard. It said, give Jesus a try. For what? Is that like playing the lotto? Oh, I gave Jesus a try. I was a Christian for a season. I went to the church and we sang the songs and I gave the money and I hung out with people. And you know what? I just decided it wasn't for me. And I went on down the road and I'm not a Christian anymore. No, you believed in vain. You did not believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You did not understand that Jesus is your God, creator, and judge. And he's the one that bought your soul and paid for your sins. And you did not trust in him. Those of you that have believed that, there's nothing I could do or say to convince you that Jesus is not God. You know for a fact that He's your Savior. I mean, if they wanted to torture you and take pliers and twist your fingernails out, you'd say, I don't care, it hurts, but you know what? Jesus is still God. And in the same way, I can't convince you that the sun isn't yellow and that it doesn't rise and set. You're like, I've seen it my whole life. I believe it. Well, it's the same way with faith in Jesus. We trust in Him. There are those that claim to be Christians, but they have only believed in vain. They never were a Christian. They were not a Bible believer. They never took the gift of grace. Finally, go to Galatians 4, and we'll finish here. Galatians chapter 4, look at verse number 10, please. Ye observe days, and months, and times, and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. First we see the one that believed in vain. Now we see the one that they even thought they were a disciple, but like, I put all this effort into teaching you salvation by faith alone, and now you're trying to keep the feasts and the festivals, and you're doing all this stuff that has nothing to do with Jesus? He says, I'm afraid of you. I've labored in vain. Go to the next chapter, chapter 5. Last verse, Galatians 5, verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Anybody that does not believe salvation is free has fallen from grace. Anybody that says you must persevere to the end, they have fallen from grace. Anybody that says if you go back to your old sins, you're not saved, they have fallen from grace. They don't have grace. Look what it says. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Anybody that says, let's keep the Passover, let's kill a lamb, and let's build a temple, they're fallen from grace. Anybody that says you have to repent of all of your sins to be saved, they're fallen from grace. They don't have grace. They don't understand grace that salvation is by faith alone, that it's a free gift, that it's eternal life, plain and simple. That phrase, free gift, it bothers some people just as much as that phrase, once saved, always saved. I've had people slam doors on me. <laughs> we had a guy one time that slammed a garage door on us while we were out preaching the gospel. Arr! I mean, it was kind of slow and awkward, like, okay. <laughs> I had a lady, I was out with my wife, had all the kids. This lady's coming home from church and 
she was dressed very interestingly, and I'll say that without trying to insult her get up. Oh, we just coming from church. You know, oh, good, okay, where do you go to church? Okay. And I start talking to her, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? And I mean, within, within just like a minute and a half, she says, you're not preaching once saved, always saved, are you? Because I don't believe that. And it's like, well, then, ma'am, then you're not saved. You've fallen from grace. Either you believe it's all Jesus, and it's totally free, it's a gift, or you're not saved. You're trusting in yourself, and you will fall. You will disappoint yourself. Thank God salvation is free. Thank God the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that we have this free gift in our hand, why don't we go give it to somebody? Amen. Let's do that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for making it easy to be saved. Thank you that your yoke is easy. Lord, thank you for not requiring a life of endurance to be saved. But Lord... I do ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would reveal our sin to us and help us get closer to you. Lord, we do want to keep the law to please you, and we know it has nothing to do with our salvation. Lord, I pray that you would help grace to abound in this church. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.